I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Creek Devil. Tom, would you like to do the honors today? I would love to. Sarah, welcome aboard. Sarah, you're from Queensland, Australia. Is that correct? Uh, I'm actually down in Victoria in, uh, in a little town called Castlemaine. Okay, so that would be south of Queensland? Yes, yes. Uh, it's it's a, a two states south. So Queensland's right in the north east of the country and Victoria's down in the southeast. So okay. There's quite a few hours drive between the two places. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yep. We're in, I'm in uh, a place called Oregon in California. We're on the West Coast of the U.S. And uh, definitely considered, will you agree that it's kind of um, Bigfoot country here? I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, hope, I hope we didn't lose Will. Oh, no. Okay, I there you are. Okay. Um, so, Sarah, welcome aboard. Thank and you. And you're with the Australian Yowie Research. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. That's okay. Right. And we've had two people on. Uh, we had Annie and Daryl, who were, uh, I think they were on your show a while back. And then we had uh, a guy named Baz, who was also on. And here's the thing. Well, you and I talked about this. What part of what we're doing is we're finding repeating patterns between the Bigfoot of North America and the Yowie of Australia. And quite frankly, there's almost no difference. Well, patterns and behaviors very similar. Right. Um Sarah, what I'm going to start off. I've got a question for you. What can you tell us about the the indigenous lore, the legend of the Yowie? And I think there's another another at least one other name for the creature there. But how far back in history do the stories go? And is there any kind of um, indigenous, you know, petroglyphs or artwork, rock rock artwork, that sort of thing? Okay, so as so as we mentioned before, Australia is a very large country, and there are different Aboriginal First Nations peoples, different uh, countries, all over the country. So um, there are there are many different many different names for the the hairy fella, the hairy man, as as they often call him in English, it's it's the hairy man. Uh, one of the most common names, one of the Aboriginal names that's used, well, Yowie is one of them, but uh, Doolagal is another name for these beings, and um, that's that's used in New South Wales. Uh, there's another word called Quinkin, which is used further up, I believe, up in the Northern Territory in Northern Queensland. Um, there's also we, we seem to have two species of these beings here that, that are similar, but one is the big fella and one is the little fella. Um, so we have different different names for the little fellas as well. One of those is Junjadi. Um, another one is Wudachi. Uh, so, yeah, there's, there's, there's many different names. They're involved in, as far as I know, and I'm not Aboriginal, so I try, I, I don't like to tell their stories too much, but as far as I understand, uh, there are stories relating to the hairy man going back uh, forever, going back, go, going back as long as, well, they still have them in their culture. They're still telling stories about them. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, they're an intrinsic part of many Aboriginal people's culture um 
and they're also they also quite happily believe not quite happily maybe that's a bit flippant um they believe that these beings are are flesh and blood but also have a supernatural paranormal element to them a spiritual element to them what are the differences between the big ones and the little ones and i think geographically um our previous guest said the big ones tend to be more on the East Coast and the West Coast tends to be more of the um, West Coast. Can you give us some details on that? Yeah, as, well, we get reports of both from from both East and West Coast. Um, we certainly, I guess of late, I've interviewed quite a few more witnesses who have had the little fella encounters over near Perth, uh, in, in which is the capital of Western Australia, the, the westernmost state. Um, so differences-wise between the big and the little, I've had some, <clears throat> excuse me, I've had some Aboriginal people tell me that they are separate entities. They're completely different beings, both very ancient entities. Uh, one is perhaps more, uh, more mischievous, than the other, which and, and I've heard people say that about the the little hairy fellas, uh, but then again, some people have had uh, frightening, aggressive encounters with the the little the little ones. Um, someone I interviewed from Western Australia not that long ago um, had a, a, a five foot tall creature, but who looked like an adult to him. So we're thinking it's a it's a Junjadi or a Wudachi and it's 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 roared and snarled at him and thrown a, a rock that's just whizzed past his head. Um, so it was quite aggressive. Um, but I think if you were to ask if you were to ask First Nations people all around the country what the differences are, they all have a different story to tell you. So um, as far as uh, main differences it's is the size uh, they come in similar colors so we get reports of black of dark brown of reddish brown uh for both the big ones and the little ones um yeah th there's there's as far as differences go it's mainly size sarah that's interesting because Everything that you described with the uh, it, the the different, uh, you know, you got different tribes or indigenous groups. They all have different names. Uh, same thing here in West, in, uh, in uh, North America. We get kind of the similar situation. All these different American Indian tribes have different names for uh, for the creatures, and predominantly, the stories here are about Sasquatch, the big ones. But there are Periodically, you hear uh, stories about the little ones, and no pun intended, but I've heard very little about the little ones here. <laughs> but um, what are some of the what are some of the names that you've heard them be referred to? The little ones, because I haven't heard much about the little ones in the United States either. I don't know. Uh, Will may have heard some names for the little ones. I haven't. The main one, well, the one I know is. Uh, from my contact with the Klamath Indians in Southern Oregon, and they call the little ones uh, the Guganas. And they say they're, they're very mischievous. Yeah, right. Interesting. Guganas. And, Will, I think you've also said, or you just speculated, you know, just kind of thinking, is it possible that the little ones are actually younger juveniles you know very young of of regular sasquatch it's possible sure we don't know but it is possible yeah i think yeah. when when we try to um decide if someone has seen a creature or found footprints tracks um we generally try we generally think that they they're juvenile um if there's bigger tracks around them or they're, they're accompanied by one of the bigger creatures. Um, it, it's, it's more commonly thought, I guess, that a young one, a juvenile, isn't going to be running around by itself uh, and consequently that a bigger one will be very, near, very close by. Whereas if you find a lone track that's only 
you know, a very small size and you can't find any evidence that there were any other bigger creatures around than perhaps that was a Junjadi, a small, a little fella. Yeah, that's a good, that's interesting. That's a good conclusion. And that would make sense because if it is a young one, uh, an infant or, or a juvenile, yeah, the parents are probably going to, you know, so you're going to have some either older siblings or parents nearby. Um, going back just for a moment, uh, I, what I find interesting at the beginning of your show, it l- looks like there is some artwork or petroglyphs of these creatures. And is this something that has been discovered? Is it common? Uh, or does it even exist? Yes, it, it does. I, I, I can't profess to be an expert on the Aboriginal art around this, this subject. Um, but from what I understand, there are quite a few different petroglyphs of a creature that people are interpreting as uh, a, a yaoi or, or a big hairy fella. Um, it, they, it, it, they do exist. There's various of them around the country, but uh, I can't tell you much more about it because I haven't studied that too much. Right. Well, kind of where I was going with this is just simply the fact that the fact that the artwork exists in the first place and that it's attributed to these creatures is more supporting evidence that they exist. It's the same thing over here. There's plenty of petroglyphs and artwork that accompanies the the Indian lore here as well as in the Pacific Northwest uh, the the coastal tribes have totem poles with um, a certain one of the figures in the totem pole with pursed lips is said to be a Sasquatch because they're called night whistlers. So again, it just kind of points to uh, the existence of the creatures. And I remember seeing an interview with an anthropologist. She was either with the uh, Forest Service or the Bureau of Land Management, one of those two agencies. And her, you know, I mean, she's an anthropologist. I don't think she had any sightings or any evidence. But she became a believer that they must exist because at the time of her interview, she had over 500 names from different tribes all throughout the United States. And these names go back to, you know, uh, you know, centuries, if not millennia. And she said there just had to be something there in order for these names to exist. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and that's exactly right with with the First Nations peoples here. Uh, there's it, the stories of them uh, are so common. There's so many different names for them all over the country uh, that it's hard to imagine that the all the First Nations all the First Nations people have invented this this myth with, with nothing, no factual, no basis to to. To, to base any of that those words on any of that language or any of that stories is is it just old wives tales to make children not stray from from camp at night mm, I you know I find this it's it's too common for it to be just that I believe talking with Baz and Annie we got the real strong impression that there's not a lot of general acceptance of the creature. <laughs> at all and it's it's really almost a, a topic that you just don't really talk about yeah yeah uh, okay yeah, yeah, yes totally it's it's um I, I i get very strange looks when i explain to people what i do <laughs> there, we don't have the big um we don't have such a widespread appreciation of the subject for sure and we don't have we certainly don't have the commercial commercialization of the subject of bigfoot over here like like you guys do there we don't have Bigfoot conferences. Uh, we don't have. Um, unfortunately, maybe we can start one because <laughs> that'd be really cool. But uh, part of the reason why I started my my radio show, Yowie Central, was to destigmatize the subject. And the reason why Dean Harrison started Australian Yowie Research is again to su- help support people who have these terrifying encounters and no one believes them, or they get ridiculed, uh, or they have to sit on this terribly traumatic thing that happened and they can't tell anyone it's um yeah it's quite a sh- it's quite a shame so we're into talking about it and destigmatizing it over here 
Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, that must be a traumatizing thing when you're mm. uh, you're isolated and you, yeah, you just kind of left to your own devices. You really can't share it with anybody or, and unburden because it really, frankly, it's a burden. Everybody, I would say 98% of the people we talk to, it's lifting a weight off their shoulders just to be able to share it with a group that they don't have any hurdles to get over to try to convince us that what they saw was real and and they're with a group that understands and and believes them do you with with all that said um and i think you kind of answer this question but i'll ask it anyway do you feel like what your efforts are the australian yaoi research are you guys kind of pioneering a sense of general acceptance of this topic breaking ground so to speak yeah absolutely and like if it wouldn't, wasn't for Dean Harrison starting this organisation in the first place, like twenty five years ago or something. I mean, he started just collecting information because when he had a couple of terrifying encounters himself, and he thought he was going to die, there was no one. This was in in the early days of the internet too. There was just there was very little information that he could access about what happened to him. You know, to talk to, there wasn't anyone to talk to about it. Uh, so he basically is responsible for pioneering the whole subject here. But I guess what we do now as a team with me on board and with uh, the other team members, Gary and Buck, um, we we are pioneers to it, definitely. Uh, there's more and more people who are interested in the subject now and there's, there's a few other uh, organisations that are doing research, but... Um, Australian Yowie Research was the first, and I guess we're the one with the, with the main one, uh, with the largest. We have a database of over a thousand reports dating back a couple of hundred years till to the beginning of European settlement, and of course, then there are the the Aboriginal stories dating back way longer than that. Um, so, yeah, to to answer your question, yes, we we are we are pioneers to a certain extent. No, it sounds like you're definitely pioneers, and what Dean has done and what you're doing it is very commendable because it's uh, you know it takes a you know you're kind of the brave souls going out there and getting this started. So um, yeah, kudos to you guys. Um, I was looking at your show and one of your podcasts, and there's. I'll try to pronounce this. There's a, it's called the Benarkin State Forest. Oh, yes. Yep, yep. Okay, what can you tell us about that? That seems to be kind of an area of high activity. Okay, just let me, I'm going to get it up on my map because it is, I don't live up there, so I'm, I have to um, just get it up in my mind. And it has a kind of a uh, comical, at least from my perspective, uh, name that is, that's associated with it. <laughs> oh yes, yes. I think that's probably why Dean didn't 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 put the actual location of Black Butt on the <laughs> right on, on the uh, report. You're talking about the report that just came out yesterday that we just did. Is that the one you're referring to? Uh, it probably is. I'd have to go back and check the date stamp on it. But yeah, it was. Uh, it was the Benarkin State Forest and uh, right. the Black Butt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's actually yes. named after a tree. Is that right? Yes, it is. Okay. It is. <laughs> it's, not, um, it's not a rude name at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, look, all the, way, all the way along the Great D- Dividing Range, so along the eastern coast of Australia, we have a mountain range that goes pretty much all the way from north to south called the Great Dividing Range. Now, particularly up in... The, in, in Queensland, northern New South Wales, Queensland, up where the, the rest of the team are, um, that, that region, and particularly in the Gold Coast and Sunshine Coast hinterland, is very active. We have lots and lots of reports of um, big fellas and little fellas, mostly big fellas. Um, that's sort of the, the research area that Dean and the boys uh, well, that's it. But Benarkin is a little bit further north than where they're researching at the moment. But all of that area is lush, semi-tropical rainforest. 
um, heavily thick, dense forest. So we get a lot of we get a lot of reports from 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 that area, lots and lots. So it's a state park. I'm assuming there's there must be like hiking trails and can people go camping and that sort of thing. Oh and- yes, yes, yes. They can do all of that. Um, I I haven't been to Benarkin myself, um, but my mum lives up that way, um, and so I know sort of sort of the area around there. And it's it's just beautiful rainforest, but but because it's so it's so dense and so thick, um, I mean I was looking at the, the the dean and the boys went on a, an expedition last weekend, and the the hike to get in and out of the forest was it, it was so much hard work just go, just getting four meters down down a track down a waterfall. No, they're not even going on you know, on tracks actually. They're sort of cutting through forest. But even to get a few advance a few meters, uh, it's such hard work. They're all really fit, and uh, they take videos as they go and send them to me, so I don't feel left out. And uh, they they were they were exhausted and dripping with sweat, and it was it's really hard going. So uh, while it, because it is so, such hard going, you don't actually get many humans walking through the bush out there. Um, hence why. I guess why there's a there's a they, the boys do a lot of research up there, um, and why we get so many uh, sightings up that way, a lot of a lot of territory, a lot of nice places for uh, a shy yowie to hide from humans. Well, I got to tell you, I've watched these guys going out there and camping and camping in hammocks. I'm like, wow. Now these are guys after my own heart, but I am. Absolutely. If I'm in Bigfoot country, I'm not camping in a hammock. We've we've got <laughs> jokes about that. <laughs> what are you camping in then? A reinforced tent? <laughs> yeah, titanium tents, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so, yeah, it, it's very interesting. And, and later on, I want to talk to you about one of the videos they had was actually from a gal here in the States from Mississippi, who got it, some interesting uh, footage of what's quite possibly one of these things. But um, so the Benarkin State Forest is is a hot spot, and that would only make sense. And and it's it's a lush territory, great spot for the creatures. But in order to have a creature sighting, you got to have sighter and sightee, right? Correct. Yes. Okay. So you got to have people camping and hiking and that sort of thing. Um, or, or you get, which what often happens, and I think it happens in the United States as well, is the probably the majority of sightings we get are roadside sightings. So um, not necessarily people trekking far into the, the bush, but the beings are actually coming out and somehow getting caught on the side of the road, which is quite strange when you when you think about it why they would be so stupid as to stand there there you know hearing and seeing a, a car coming um particularly at night if they're if they've got headlights on no it's it's quite inexplicable that we have so many along the roadsides you know that is interesting that you brought that up because it's john green who's one of the early pioneers on this topic here in the u.s or he actually was in canada said that about 70% of all sightings, and this was back in the 60s and 70s, were roadside sightings. And it's interesting because it's exactly what you said. Hello, I can see when a car is coming. Certainly the creatures can. So what? What? why are they doing that? We don't know. Um, but there was a, uh, I think she was, a gal that was driving along said she was doing 70 kilometers, which I think translates about 60 miles an hour. And one crossed the road, a three lane highway or a three, three lane road in three strides. And it was every bit of everything that she described. You could have taken her account and transported it to anywhere in the U.S. And it would have been exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, I, I, there's another one that we put out a little while ago um, at a place, the, the sighting was at a place called Bongle Bongle National Park, which is further south in, in New South Wales and near Coffs Harbour. And uh, they're pretty much identical 
story. She was driving a little bit faster. But this one actually tailed her, ran behind her car. She was travelling at about uh, 90 kilometres an hour at the time, very fast. This thing gallops after her on four legs and then once it reaches her car, she's still travelling fast, it stands up onto two legs, still running, and then jumps over her car and then disappears into the bush on the other side. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, and that's, I got to tell you, there's just too many stories like that to, it's it's not preposterous. It's, uh, Will, what do we do? We have T.W., who's had them, uh, a couple of deputies were, you know, responding to a call, a couple of police officers, and the rear car was a canine unit. You know, oh, no, that, dogs that, that wasn't TW. That was another uh, interview a number of years back. There were, uh, this was in Odessa, Texas, there were two uh, canine officers who were uh, deputy sheriffs that were heading for another town from Odessa because they're the county. They handle everything within the county. And they were both canine units. They had dogs in each of the two cruisers. Um, and they were, said they were doing about what he felt about 80 miles an hour. But probably wasn't that fast, but, you know. Uh, then he saw, noticed something. This was nighttime. And he noticed something out of his peripheral vision. And he saw this creature come running up on all fours. and And it was... On for all fours, it was as high as the top of the cruiser, and it paced it for a moment and then veered off. And the dogs in both vehicles went absolutely crazy, and they're trained not to do that. So, very interesting situation. And Will, there's also you have a personal account where you were trying to leave an area, and the car just wouldn't go. Tell us a little bit about that. Tell, tell Sarah about that story. That one's really interesting. Well, we were, an old friend of mine and I, in fact, it was the guy that was grabbed, you know, when we were at the Clark Ranch story. Uh, he and I were in an area. Um, it's called it's called the Bald Hills. Uh, it's sort of uh, near Fort Lewis, Washington. So it's out, out, it's out quite a ways. It's not that close to Fort Lewis, but it's in that general area. So we were out there one night just kind of looking around to see if we could hear or see anything. You know, it's, I, I was up there and we just decided to go out and take a look because it's an area that's had a lot of activity with these creatures. And uh, at one point, I, I I think we heard we heard some vocals and I decided to back up by these trees on this road. I had a little, it was a little Ford Courier, a small car, and... Um, I can't remember what prompted us to leave, but we decided to take off and I, it had a manual transmission. So I shifted it in gear and tried to go and it wouldn't move. And I'm thinking at first, oh heck, you know, the trans, something's wrong with the transmission of the car. It's not moving. So I, I shifted into a lower gear and, and really gave it gas and I could hear the tires, you know, digging into the gravel. And so I knew that wasn't the problem. There was something holding the car and then all of a sudden it was like, like a pulling a cork out of a bottle, the car being just let go. And uh, in, in the morning, I went out to check, and on the uh, side panels it, by the back seats, and it was a dark brown color, so that it was dusty because of those dirt gravel roads. And you could see these what looked like big finger marks on either side of the car, where something big had held. Well, I'm sure it was one of the creatures had held the car. You're right. <laughs> A little, little unnerving, yeah. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we we have a mutual um, friend of ours who was in a forest here in Oregon. And I, I'm not going to go too deep into this, but he was just out. Him and a buddy were just at the windows down and uh, just kind of, I think he was, he may have been working on a bourbon and a cigar. And the other guy had a cigarette and a, a beer. And one of these things suddenly ran by the truck screamed and roared my understanding was bourbon beer cigars it went flying all over the place <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, not surprised I don't right <laughs> right um so they do do stuff they really do um that is i don't want to say everything they do is out of the norm but i mean it's it's again this one that got on all fours 
parallel the car, jumped over the car. It's um, it's very much uh, in keeping with some, you know, observed behavior of theirs. Yeah, yeah, and I can think of, of you know, quite a few other very similar situations. In fact, there, there was another one, which we, we haven't published it yet, but um, if, you, if you liked the name Black Butt, you'll, <laughs> you'll like the name of this one. Uh, it was called Blue Knob the little town <laughs> um and she there's a lady ride, uh, driving in her car and uh she by herself with a little dog and she had uh, a similar creature running on two legs beside her but for uh several kilometers uh just for about 10 minutes it ran alongside her car and then just and then just ran off uh, didn't jump over her car but t- imagine 10 minutes and it's looking in the window at her Right. And I was like, oh my god! How terrifying! What, 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 was, did it have any facial expressions, or, or was it? And she said, no, it was just looking at me, like I was nothing, like I was a piece of dirt, but almost expressionless. But it just kept looking at me through the window, through the side window as it was running along. Like, oh god! And she was. And this went out for how long? You said ten so, minutes. Yeah, about ten minutes because it was quite some. Um, it was a while ago that I did I did that interview, but if I remember correctly, uh, it was quite some time, and that's a long time um, it, under those circumstances. That's a really long time. You know, and you don't know what the intent of the creature is, but really, ten minutes. I would say that's about nine minutes and fifty eight seconds too long, right? <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. I, I would have been absolutely terrified. Was well, this at night time or in day? Yeah, night time. Yeah, time. even worse. Yeah, and you're see a woman on your own, um, night driving at night. There's no other traffic around. Uh, yeah, it would have been sincerely terrifying. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It would be terrifying, really, honestly, for anybody to have that thing. I mean, look at the one that Will just talked about with the uh, the two police cruisers and the dogs. I mean, it. it you know, it, it agitated and provoked the dogs into barking that they don't, you know, they're trained not to do. So it's, uh, there's something about the creatures quite scary. Yeah. And we, we had another one that was uh, remarkable in that uh, it was a, a couple who were driving. Um, the, the man was, the, the man was driving, his wife's asleep. He notices this creature running alongside the car for quite some time as well. But this one had a, like a small, a short muzzle, so almost dogman-like in description, uh, which is more unusual here than it is in the United States. We seem to be getting a few more of late. Yeah, we do have one here. They're 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 not common, uh, but it's uh, it's called a Type Three, and it it's kind of like a baboon snout on it. So we yes. don't, beyond that, I don't know a whole lot about them, but um, yeah, very, uh, <clears throat> yeah, very interesting. So you guys got them. We have them. Yep. Yep. I don't know what, we don't know what they are yet. <laughs> we don't know what any of them are really, do we? Um, <laughs> but it's, 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 I guess it's hard, it's easier for me to get my head around a bipedal ape-like creature than it is a bipedal canine-like creature. Right. Well, and I, if it's a, I just kind of struggle with it being a uh, a canine type creature. I I can see it being a bipedal. Um, you know, baboons. Have mm. uh, they have a nickname of being, uh, you know, dog-faced uh, monkeys, and um, <clears throat> so I can I can from a physiological standpoint and the DNA and the uh, <clears throat> I just I just don't see how you could have a canine running on two legs like that. Could be wrong, but I just don't see it. Yeah, it's uh, hard to it's hard to work out. Um, from a locomotion point of view, how and an anatomical point of view, how that would work. Right, but it does make sense. And actually, I saw an interview with a gentleman who was a uh, medical professional, and he had a creature going by his house that was 
for all intents and purposes, a Sasquatch, except it had a snout. So it wasn't a dog man. It had nothing to do with that. It was purely um, just some sort of a, you know, the type three, I'm assuming. One yeah, of the right, things. Be... Sorry. Go, oh, on. go ahead. No, no, you go on. That's all right. Well, I was looking on your on your website and on one of the videos and it was very interesting. There was you had pictures of somebody that had handprints both on the roof of their vehicle and on the windows. And what can you tell us about that? I'm just trying to remember which one it was. Um, I'd have to I'd have to look that one up. Um Guys, I, I, I haven't got that one ready to talk about. Oh no, that's fine. It it's um it's something that we have you know, we have incidences like well actually I had a, a situation like that here in Oregon about two years ago. I drove to drove 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 to an area. <laughs> uh and I jokingly say I went to an area where they're not. And that's kind of a kind of a chuckle because they're quite often there. But there's absolutely zero. I've never had any indication whatsoever that the creatures are there. No footprints, no sounds, no sightings, nothing. But we hiked for well, quite a ways up to this uh, uh, lookout, overlook. And when I came back, there was this huge hand on the side of my truck. I wasn't there before. And I said it to Will. He said he's seen similar um, impressions like that. So other than that, yeah, that was it. Um, okay, another incident that hopefully you might know a little bit about, it's called the Sandy Creek incident in 1980. The, the, the Sandy Creek incident in 1980? Yeah, it was it was apparently some uh, some hunters had encountered one of these things and shot one. No, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that one. I do um, I do recall one where uh, one was shot. Uh, I interviewed someone uh, from New South Wales who reported uh, he just reported shooting one, but with a I think he had a very small caliber gun um just for use like for shooting rabbits and things like that um shot it in the left shoulder uh but didn't it didn't stop it running it ran off but it didn't it didn't leave any blood it didn't stop it didn't make any noise it just kept going and when when did this happen that was um that was a few years ago i interviewed him well, I think it was actually no, it was two about two years ago because I interviewed him last year, and he, I think it was a year before that. Right. Yeah. Well, and that's you know honestly that's consistent with what we hear in the U.S. where people have shot them. Actually, somebody that Will knows, uh, the guy was he had actually been a biker, a member of a biker gang, and later became a, a guitarist for. Um, uh, famous singer. I can't think of the singer right off the top of my head. Well, you know who it is. It was Johnny Mathis. Johnny Mathis, yes. And what, what him and his friends shot one with a thirty thirty. right? Well, the story was they, when they were part of the Hells Angels, they decided to go to Southern Oregon. There's an area called Port Orford, and a meteor had crashed there in the early 20th century. And there was some big reward, like $100,000, if you could bring the meteor in. So they thought they were going to go make some easy money and go find the Port Orford meteor. And so they rode their Harleys up there and had a fire going. And then they heard some noise up on this ridge above them that night. And it kept, it kept coming down, some kind of vocalizations. And by the time it got fairly close, you know, they were they were yelling and threatening to shoot whoever it was if they didn't come out and show themselves. And shortly after that, this creature stepped into the edge of the uh, the fire, uh, the firelight at the edge of the camp there, and just started thrashing a couple of saplings on either side of it, and it scared the two guys so bad they each had a thirty thirty and they shot it in the chest, and he said it screeched and ran off and they got in their bikes and took off because he said we thought we were going to get eaten. 
Yeah, right. Even after shooting. Yeah, they said it didn't. Apparently, didn't bother it. It just screeched and ran off. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think I'd get on my motorcycle and leave too. About that. Well, time. yeah. I... <laughs> <laughs> right. I don't think I would be. From what I've, from all the stories I've heard, um, reports from your country as well as mine, shooting one doesn't seem to make any difference whatsoever. And in fact, it just enrages. Um, the creatures so I don't think I'd be going it's, I don't think I'd be up for shooting one at all not that I really not that I really want want to do that anyway it's, like I, it's probably I don't not come the, from that it's probably mindset. not the brightest thing to do <laughs> yeah no no I don't think it's the brightest thing to do <laughs> what are some of the other encounters that you've that you've heard about some of the more interesting ones for example there was one where um, I just briefly saw just before we got on the air tonight about a group of boys a number of years ago who had encountered one of these things in the forest. And I don't know the location. I don't know if you if that's too vague of a description. Um, um, well, the, I, I'm not sure about that one, but I can tell you about um, one of the, the most popular reports that we've that we've done I, I interviewed that lady uh, about a year ago. Um, she had an absolutely terrifying encounter at Hickey's Falls, which is there. there is an area of about 3,000 square kilometres in central New South Wales called um, the Pilliga, uh, P-I-L-L-I-G-A, and there's the Pilliga National Park. Now, there's a, there's, a, there's a highway that runs all the way through the straight – through the middle of it, and right at the, the southern end of that that area, is a is a, a stop like a truck stop rest stop, and just off from there is a a waterfall, and so this woman and her seven year old child and boy and uh, her daughter her thirteen year old daughter with one of her daughter's friends, she stops there so the kids can have a swim. It's a really hot day. And the kids sort of get out of the car and race off to the the waterfall, and she she's sort of following on a little bit behind with her her younger boy, and the girls are all squealing and making a lot of noise as they do, and all of a sudden she hears this roar, like bellow, angry, uh, so loud, and and this waterfall was kind of an amphitheater shaped uh, rock. Uh, wall I guess and um, it there was this she said it was so terrifying this sound she couldn't work out what it was the children all like looked at her eyes wide going what is that what is it what is it and then she sees at the top of this waterfall on a track that's walking down towards her she sees these big trees just being pushed over snapped like matchsticks um one down and then another down and and she could hear this these massive cracks of trees and hearing something push its way through getting closer and closer so she's just like i don't know what that is she grabs hysterical grabs the boy chucks the chucks a little boy over her shoulder and runs and gets the girls to run too back to the car now the boy tells his mum that when she chucked him over her shoulder he could see behind her and he saw this giant, uh, you know, massive creature, at least 10 foot tall, come out of the forest and 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 roar, open his mouth. He had his mouth open, the little boy said, uh, making this, this awful roar. So um, she's, you know, she's hightailed it to the car. What she did find really strange was there was another car parked in that car park all the doors were flung open. Nobody in the ca- nobody in the car. It was like that some that people had jumped out of the car and run off, but left the car there. And just as she's pulling out of this this rest stop onto the highway, a, a police officer pulled her over because she was <laughs> driving a bit erratically, and um, she just said, "Don't go down there. Don't go down there. There's, just don't go down there." You, that we, and she just and accelerated and left because she was just they were all screaming hysterically and she she sort of gathers herself a few kilometers down the road and pulls over and gets all the kids to put their seatbelts on and and they see this police car 
the same guy who he whizzed up behind them, whizzed past them, and they could all see his face, and they said he looked white and terrified. Um, and she inquired after this police officer sometime later, and apparently he had arrived back at the police station shaking white, um, wouldn't talk to anyone, and left the police force not long after. Uh, so <laughs> one of the scariest situations ever, and it was just, yeah, her fear and the children's fear. No. So I've actually, there's a couple of people out there who've, I haven't had time to to to, to find out what happened to, to him, but, and it's, I think you'd probably have to be in law enforcement to get any information about, you know, ex officers. Right. It, it'd be difficult, it'd be difficult to find information. So I haven't, I haven't, I haven't tried to be honest, but I do know there are a couple of people out there who are, um, yeah, try, uh, who said they would research and see if they could find out what happened to the policeman. So, yeah, very frightening. Thing. That story, that encounter where this thing is roaring and snapping the trees over, we've heard that. We actually had a gentleman on, um, oh, gosh, a little over a year ago, who is a, a friend. Well, he, he was actually a police chief of another guest that we had on who's a, you know, one of his uh, – policeman who's on the same police force but this police chief was out hiking with his family so there's about four or five people hiking through the woods in washington state and here's this huge snap and 50 yards in front of them a tree falls right across the path well, okay that's wow well, okay i guess it can happen um but you know it was interesting but um very odd and he kept walking and this situation repeated itself five times five times they're walking along and a tree would fall over just get pushed over just beyond where they could see what did the pushing and after the fifth tree they thought you know maybe maybe we'll do this some other time turn around and <laughs> I'm like, oh, it's gutsy. probably a good decision. <laughs> yeah, tree number one, and I'm gone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Five trees. <laughs> I think we're getting the message now. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, there was some definite communication going on, and yeah. they, they, it was received and understood. <laughs> exactly. Uh, do you do you have over there? Um, what one of the other things that this lady reported from Hickey's Falls was a. a, a a terrible stench that filled the car um, and that was making them almost vomit like she was trying to drive but trying not to vomit at the same time because the, the smell was so disgusting um, that and it stayed in the car for quite some time. Do you okay. have that do you have that um, reported as well? Okay, I haven't had it where it was in a car. But I experienced that. Not in the car yeah, but Will did. Yeah, me and me and a friend were, we got a report one time, this is, oh, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago, but uh, we went to an area in southern Washington State, Skamania County, and uh, didn't have the exact location. The witness wasn't there, but he told us where to go, and it was kind of rainy the day, and, and usually odors are kind of held down when it rains, so uh, we walked into a wall of stink, and we, we both almost threw up. It was so bad. And we had to walk out of it because it was so awful. And it was only a couple of moments we were out of it. And I said, I, I want to try something. That doesn't smell like anything I've ever smelled before. So let's walk back there. And reluctantly, we walked back to the same spot and it was gone. <laughs> the air was completely right. clear. So clearly it wasn't, it wasn't a dead a carcass no, or anything and, and lying we, around nearby. No, we did a search of the area and I did find some a mossy area that was flattened down recently. So something was right there, not more than 20 or 30 feet away from us, watching us. And we walked into that odor. And what did, what did it smell like? I, you know, I grew up on a farm where we did a lot of butchering and, you know, a lot of livestock and things. So you smell a lot of disgusting things on farms. And I, I tell you, I cannot pinpoint, I can't compare it to anything. There isn't anything that smelled like that. It was so bad. <laughs> but enough something that was so disgusting that you 
dry retched. Oh, we did. We did absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we I, get a uh, lot of we get a lot of reports of that. Um, not all, not in every encounter, not in every sighting, but we do get lots of reports of a really foul stench. Yeah, and I think it's kind of the exception. Uh, last summer, I was out with uh, a couple of buddies, and we were in an area that had um, actually I had a kind of a growling encounter there exactly two weeks earlier. So they said, "Come on, let's go up there." And let's check it out. So we spent the whole day up there. It was 102 degrees outside. I don't know what that comes to in Celsius off the top of my head. But anyway, it was it was a very hot day. And I kind of felt bad because we'd spent the entire day out there, the top of this mountain in the, in the Cascades. And as we're leaving, I smelled this horrible smell. Almost smelled like something dead, but it wasn't that. I'd never smelled the smell before. And... Walked on, I don't know, 20 yards, maybe. And I mentioned it. Hey, did you guys smell that? And they said, no. What? So we went back to the area, and the first guy immediately says, yeah, I smell it. Then the second guy smelled it. I smelled it. As we're walking out, now that smell is pacing us the entire way as we're leaving the area. Um, <clears throat> one of the guys, and, you know, if you look into like a densely wooded forest it would be like a tunnel or a like a corridor that might go back several several yards this one went back about 70 yards and immediately one of the guys saw the creature and yelled he saw it and <clears throat> interesting he almost never uses the term bigfoot or um, sasquatch it's always something that rhymes with truckers <laughs> right that's not very respectful <laughs> right <laughs> and and he saw it and then we went worked our way we got back to the trucks and there's another corridor and just out of the corridor my eyes again where these corridors goes back about 70 yards i saw it just for a brief instant just and um but yeah we we smelled that smell and it was it wasn't like what that person that you described or what will you know where it's almost made you dry wretch uh we may have been far enough we we're probably 30 40 feet away i'm guessing probably about 30 feet away from this thing uh i think it was a juvenile because that was probably about six and a half feet tall um <clears throat> it was muscular but not that big bulky thing so i don't know anyway it was nasty but it didn't uh wasn't quite to the point of you know making us want to heave or anything. Do you think that that smell? I was discussing this with. Um, I spoke to someone who was a used to be a zookeeper, and we were talking about he knew something about great apes, and we were talking about how gorillas have this ability to. Was it gorillas or chimpanzees? No, it was the silverback gorillas have this ability to emit this this really bad smell as a deterrent when they're threatened or, or trying to scare you away. They have scent glands. He wasn't, yeah, so like a scent, like a skunk. It's when they become um, agitated, yeah. Yeah, so do you think that that's what's going on here? Or, or I do, yes. He was, he, yeah, he, he was thinking it's more just some are more, in, more into personal hygiene than others. Well, and so some. Here's the way I look at it. I've, I mean, I've looked at, I mean, Good Lord, I've done this almost 50 years. All the reports I've and people I've talked to over all that time, um, the smell in, in the papers here, they like to report it as being a commonality among witness encounters, and it's not. Um, you might get a smell, you know, out of 20 reports once or twice. So I, I suspect that what's going on is that there's some kind of an agitation. Uh, my own encounter, you know, when I was 16, I was, you know, less than 20 feet away from one. And then a second one walked around and there was no odor whatsoever. Yeah, right. That's, that's very close. So I, I think it's when they're agitated that they have a scent gland, probably similar to gorillas. Right. Right. And I, I mean, I guess there would also be varying... Uh, depending on, I guess, the terrain where that particular creature 
the, the, their territory, um, some appear to be in reports to us. Some appear to be, uh, you know, have beautiful, clean fur or hair, um, and others seem to be really matted and and gnarly looking. So, um, do you get that variation in 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 their in their fur as well, in in how the fur looks, whether it's kempt or unkempt? You know, I think it depends. It depends on a lot of factors. Um, when I saw those two creatures, uh, the hair was not very well kept. It was, it was matted. There was stuff in it from them moving through the brush. Um, but you look at the Patterson f- uh, film, and, and it looks fairly well groomed. But that area is different than where I lived. So uh, the underbrush is not very thick. Uh, you know, they have an easier time moving through the terrain, through the timber, without having to go through stuff like that. So I, I think that plays a large role in it, and probably weather conditions and, and things like that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we, we had a report, um, and this was, uh, I, I spoke to the woman earlier this year, but uh, the, the report was from about four years ago, five years ago, and she was up on Mount Hotham, which is, um, in the the uh, great part of the Great Dividing Range mountain range, it's in the in the southern end, closer to me. And she um, she and her husband saw a, uh, a a creature that was about six to seven foot tall, but and and didn't was buff but not super chunky. Looked fairly lean. They they got the impression that it was perhaps juvenile, but it had long blonde flowing gleaming hair that that sort of flapped as he walked um long blonde and gleaming like it she she said he looked stunning like we nick don't we, we've nicknamed him in our australian yowie research team we nicknamed him the fabio <coughs> yowie because he because he had this long gorgeous blonde hair well <laughs> i'll give you an interesting parallel tom you remember when we talked to darcy recently in uh, North Carolina. I was thinking the exact same she's, thing, yes. She's seen three creatures there, but two different variations. Uh, two of the creatures are, are very much like what we have in the Pacific Northwest here. Those are the big, blocky, they look like a giant stump, is what they look like, because they're so thick from top to bottom. Uh, then there's the other one. She said it was, she calls it the blonde, because it has blondish colored hair, and it's very muscular. You, you can see the, the de- muscle definition, where the other two, you really don't. Right, and we also had a report up in, uh, of all places, in upstate New York. Uh, I think uh, probably northwestern New York where they had, uh, it's been seen a few times. I don't know if it's the same one or maybe, you know, maybe it's a family, of, but uh, the blonde-looking Bigfoot. Yeah, and this, this um the inter- there was one very interesting part of her sighting, apart from the whole sighting was interesting, but this Yowie was carrying a cowbell, an old cowbell in it, in one of its hands, which we thought was such a fascinating detail. I've never heard that before. Um, must have found it somewhere in a field and picked it up. I mean, we don't even use cowbells much anymore, so it, it, it must have been an old one somewhere that it's found. But, yeah, carrying a cowbell. You know, that is it. That is um an interesting detail, and the reason I say that is because there have been caches of objects, you know, human objects, things that people use that have gone back back in time up through, you know, the modern time where it's not often, but they find them in very, very obscure, very hard to find places, very remote locations, and so, and the cowboy, I wonder if it was kind of shiny or it just was, you know, maybe something about it intrigued it. Um, but it's not unheard of. Yeah, although we did we did initially think, oh, God, if, the, if it's got a cowbell, what happened to the poor cow? But on, well, on further, that's what I was thinking. On, <laughs> on further thought, though, it, it's, it's, it's not a, a farming practice that's used quite as much anymore, the, the old cowbell. So... Not sure. It could have found it somewhere, anywhere. Um, there's there's <laughs> lots of lots of farming country around there. Well, and I, I just couldn't help but wondering, maybe it associated that with cows and 
thought they could ring it and bring some dinner. Yes, I don't know. yes, as a lure. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, what do you call uh, those? What do you call those duck with those things to to get ducks to come to you? Uh, right, uh, a duck call, right? Yes, <laughs> like that. <laughs> uh, a big cow call, yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately for the bigfoot, and fortunately for the cow, <clears throat> it will probably have zero impact. They have no success calling in cows with a <laughs> cowbell that I know of. No, no, no. I'm I'm sure that uh, I'm sure that even a cow would be too smart for that. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, there and there are actually there's some videos. There's a I saw one of a, a lady in Sweden who still uses the old. It's kind of a yodeling that they use to call the oh, cows yes. in. Yep, yep. And it works, you know. Well, it works because the cows know that they get food, so of course that works. Um, so, so you could potentially see a Bigfoot imitating that call. Yeah, you know, and, and honestly, I think they do imitate a lot. Of, I think they have a very incredible vocal range, and it could be different with different ones. But, yeah, you do hear them. I have never heard them mimic anything, but I've heard their screams. And a matter of fact, I recorded some screams uh, about two weeks ago. I was hooking up a uh, a recorder. A friend of mine and I were up there. And we didn't hear it while I'm attaching it to the tree with some wire and some tape and stuff. Um, but when I went, picked it up the next day, you can hear me fussing around. But off in the distance, you could hear these two very distinct screams. And they weren't mountain lions, you know, if anybody's wondering about that. that mountain lions sound exactly what, like what they are, a, a large cat. And this was nothing like that. Yeah, but, right. Yeah, they, um, and this is an area where we, you know, we found tons of footprints. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I guess they can, you know, they all sorts of sounds they can make. And so was that in, um, is that in Oregon, Tom? Yes. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah, it, it yeah. was an area that, well, actually, it was about a mile from the area that I talked about earlier with the uh, with the foul odor. Mm-hmm. And that was a year ago. So, yeah, they seem to inhabit that area. It looks like, a, I, I've never been there, but it looks like an absolutely beautiful place, Oregon. Yeah, it is. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm a little bit biased, but, yeah, I think it's very pretty. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and as they say, very squatchy. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of them here. And... Um, but, you know, I've, it's, again, uh, I, I've been looking at the maps and Google Earth of Eastern Australia, and typically I thought of Australia as kind of a dry rock, but actually you get on the eastern side, and it's very lush, a lot of tropical, subtropical forests, and just very beautiful country. Absolutely. Yeah. And the team... Is it done? Now, does Dean Harris? Does he still go out and do this, or is it uh, just the other guys? Oh no, yeah, Dean's Dean's the one organising all the all the expeditions. Um, so he they were out. He was out with with the other two or the three of them last last weekend. Um, it's actually so all the way down that that up and down that mountain range. There's rainforest starting with you know tropical, then to semi tropical, and then temperate down further towards where I, I am, um, it's temperate rainforest. But it's it's dense, so dense, and there's just vast uninhabited tracts of forest, um, thousand, yeah. tens of thousands of, of square kilometres. Yes, absolutely. I, I got to tell you, these are guys after my own heart. They, they go out and do the stuff that I thoroughly enjoy. Um, and I saw a video, I think it's called Strickland. The Strickland uh -huh. Trail is that, did I get that the, correct? The the Strickland track or the Strickland where where they got the footage is that where they got the thermal camera footage? Is yeah, yeah, the guy about? had the flare yes. and he'd never yes. used it before and beginner's <laughs> luck. <Poor> man. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but he was so disappointed with himself that he didn't because he was flicking through the different coloured filters, thinking he was zooming it um, because he'd never used it before. So right. <laughs> so unfortunately, he didn't. You know, he was he was kicking himself that he didn't get better footage um no, that we but only got, got good those footage 
He sure did. Wasn't it amazing? Like I, when when they when they sent that to me, that 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 very moment, as soon as they saw what was on it, they sent it to me, and I almost fell out of my chair. It was, it was oh my god, look at that, look at that. You could They've clearly the see whole something. Profile. Yeah, it, it, was, it was something was behind the tree, and then you could see this large man-like figure bending down to pick something up and they said they didn't know what it's picking up and i'm like i know what it's picking up it's picking up a rock you guys better hide yeah <laughs> but interestingly though they haven't had in that particular spot they haven't had any rock throwing so they have in other areas but they they, they sort of felt because they hadn't had any aggressive behavior from and that, that's a particular spot they've been researching regularly they haven't had any hostile behaviour. So they were hoping that by just going there regularly, camping, not, you know, not looking like they were actively hunting, um, mm-hmm. th- that they would draw them in so they could uh, – and, and they haven't, as I said, they haven't they haven't found that they, there was any hostile behaviour there. But taking, well, getting that footage and he – like he didn't – they were silent, entirely silent, which is incredible. They were able to come close and move away in silence. Okay, and that's what really got me because I watched that and the fact that they're right. That's exactly what happened last year with the one with the odor. Um, it was. It had to have been watching us for a couple hours the whole time. It was watching us. We had zero indication that there was anything there until we left the area and it and then that odor came out i think it just got provoked by our presence we we i think we just got too close to it and and that was provocative and then it it you know like will says and it's it's a uh, defense mechanism it's an agitation and that's when it started <clears throat> so very interesting And that's, you know, actually, that's a point I want to make to our listeners out there, both your listeners and and the ones here, is that you can be within a very close proximity. You can be within 20 or 30 feet of these things, and you will have zero indication of it, none whatsoever. You don't see them, but they do see you. Absolutely. And that's why their dean is so convinced that these um, these new thermal cameras that are really good quality uh, is a game changer because it's not infrared, uh, so they they're not they can't actually see any light being emitted from the camera. Um, uh, it's obviously completely silent as well. Um, it, it's probably one of the only ways that you can hope to get any footage of them. I believe is is through the the thermal camera because. Trying to get it during the daytime is, so, you know, impossible. As we as we see, there aren't too many clear uh, photos of these creatures out there, are there? Um, right. So, you know, nighttime is a better a better chance. But before, I mean, that, that, that there's the theory that they can sense or see infrared light. So it's very difficult to get pictures of them on trail cams as well, on the, on the you know your standard infrared trail cam. But uh, with these thermal cameras. They don't know you've got. They don't know the cameras there either. Yeah, I, I would agree 100. percent They, they mm. can absolutely see infrared. You know, people don't realize that we can see uh, a very, very small portion of infrared. You can just see a glow of infrared. But you know, I think these creatures have more rods and cones. They just have a greater ability to see trail cams. And you know, people put the trail cams out thinking they're going to catch one of these things when the reality is if you look at any of the videos of trail cams you get deer that walk by they turn and look right at the trail cam the elk they turn they look right at the trail cam the coyotes the wolves the bears everything look at the trail cam hey tom why wouldn't these things here's well here's a big reason why and it's not so much well they can see the ir but the bigger reason when you when you compare the behavior to other primates in the wild, they are very wary because they're high and highly intelligent. They're very very wary of objects that don't belong in their environment, and they are intimately knowledgeable about their environment. 
and they know what does and does not belong there, and especially man-made objects. And other primates in Africa are the same way, and they react the exact same way to man-made objects. They're very wary of them, and they'll make a wide uh, berth around them to avoid those objects. If the creatures are coming into a man-made area, like a farm or something, that's a different story because man-made objects belong there. But if it's in their environment, they're going to avoid them. Well, what do you think about when people are putting these out in the forest? Also, there's the possibility that they're under observation. The creature is sitting there going, yeah, look at this. Yeah, look what he's up to. Oh, it's, I'm sure they see that occasionally. But again, that's that's a human activity. They don't like humans per se. So what we're doing and what we put out there, they're going to stay away from it. One of the one of the research strategies that Dean and the team use is uh, is that just regular just a regular family camping cooking uh, they play uh, Dean often plays um, music but cl- uh, classical music we've been playing lately to see if that would be any uh, any will inspire any curiosity in them um, but it's it's that while most of the team is sitting there chatting, cooking, playing music, one one or two of the, the boys will be off in the dark with the thermal camera some distance away uh, So and, and just sitting there by themselves silently. Uh, so, so that's a – sorry, go on. Well, he's playing classical music. Do you know if it's Beethoven, Mozart? Uh, <laughs> we've, we've actually been – I sent him a playlist – um, of just different classical music, classical music hits. So it's, it's a mixture of everything, really. Right. Um, I was, I was, I sent him a Carmina Burana, which is a big opera, like oh, yeah, loud yeah. <laughs> thing. But, um, but he decided that he wanted to use just instrumental, but without, yeah, that'll the, drive without away, the human yeah. voices. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, so no, it was a mix of different classical composers. Uh, but he thought, but he thought that might just be something different that that's unusual you don't get too many people going out camping blasting classical music do you no no not here in oregon no (laughs) no. (laughs) unfortunately (laughs) well listen um sarah we we got to have you back on the show because i think you've got a lot more information and this is again the whole purpose of this is not only to get some accounts that's going on in your neck of the woods over in Australia. But what Will and I find absolutely fascinating is the repeating patterns, the corroboration, the how how similar these creatures really are. Um, What I'd like you to do is send us your link uh, so that we can put that in the description because we'd like to do a little cross-platform promotion. And, Uh, uh, and, uh, And then just go ahead and stay on the line afterwards we'll just have a couple questions for you okay well um thank you so much for having me on your show i'd be delighted to come back again and you'll have to come on you'll have to come on my show well absolutely you name the time (laughs) and we're there okay done sounds great (laughs) thanks for listening to this episode of creek devil if you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.